I've been involved in the debates, the global debates over globalization now for a decade and a half. Uh, an important and interesting question is how those debates have changed in that span of time. The beginning of the 90s, uh, there was enormous support for globalization, a uh, belief that everybody, both in the developed and less developed countries, would benefit, uh, the poorest would benefit, and the richest would benefit. Since then, globalization has united the world, but against it. Uh, in fact, one of the most important global movements has been the global movement against globalization. Uh, a global soci civil society movement involving hundreds of thousands of people all over the world. The question of those who believe that globalization would work is why, why has globalization generated such antipathy from both the developed and the less developed countries when both were supposed to benefit? Some people think that's a problem of psychiatry. The real problem is that people are better off, but they just don't know it. And you then have to send a psychiatrist to make them realize that they are happier. But in fact, as we did economic studies at the World Bank and elsewhere, after the end of the last round of trade negotiations, the Uruguay round that com was completed in 1994, we realized that many of the poorest countries of the world were actually made worse off. It wasn't just that they got a smaller share of the gains. Everybody expected the United States and the Europe to get the largest share of the gains. But what actually happened is that the poorest countries in the world were worse off. And that was because of the asymmetric way in which globalization had proceeded. The advanced industrial countries demanded that the poorest countries open up their markets, eliminate their subsidies, but the advanced industrial countries did not fully reciprocate. In particular, in the area which is of most important to developing countries, agriculture, where 70% of the people live directly or indirectly off of agriculture. Europe, United States, Japan kept their enormous subsidies, kept their markets closed, and the result of this was to lower the income of the poorest people in the world. The question then is, where is the globalization debate going today? We actually do know that the way it has been managed in the past has left the poorest worse off. And I think that constitutes the biggest change in the debate over globalization we now realize that not everybody will automatically benefit. That globalization is a powerful force. It can lift the well-being and improve the living standards of those in both the advanced developed industrial countries and the poorest countries. But it hasn't been doing that. And so the challenge today is to make globalization work. How do we make it work? Well, to understand that, we have to understand some of the reasons and some of the ways in which globalization has not lived up to its promise. Well, if I were asked what are the major failures of globalization, what are the major ways in which it has not lived up to its promise, there is actually a long list. One could begin, as I say, by talking about where it has not lived up to its promise. It was supposed to bring increased living standards everywhere in the world. In fact, some of the poorest people in the poorest countries have been made worse off. At one time, advocates of globalization believed that economic integration, financial market integration, would lead to greater stability, greater economic, global economic stability. The IMF almost forced many of the countries of the world to take away their restrictions on short-term capital flows, opening up markets to destabilizing capital flows, arguing that it would lead to greater global economic stability. Well, they were wrong. And the global markets, global economy, has experienced enormous instability in, in recent years.
And part of the reason is that the policies like capital market liberalization have been pushed too far and in ways without the appropriate safeguards that have actually contributed to instability. So this is an example where it, the promise was greater stability, the consequences have been greater instability. The same thing, as I said before, was true about trade liberalization. It was supposed to promote the well-being of all of the countries, but in fact, the poorest countries of the world have been left less well off. Now, globalization has many dimensions, and not just economics. Uh, economic globalization is the part that we, we often focus on, and economic globalization has resulted in enormous benefits to a few countries in the world, to China, to India, who have experienced enormous economic growth. China has been growing for the last 30 years at over 9.5% a year. India has been growing for the last quarter century at over 5% of the year, and this year it's expected to grow at close to 8%. And though that growth has largely been based on globalization, on exports, but what these countries have done has been they've learned how to manage globalization for their own benefit. For instance, they did not open up their capital markets to destabilizing capital flows. And yet, they, they were able to get large amounts of foreign direct investment. China has been the largest recipient of foreign direct investment of all, any of the developing countries. So they were very careful in the way they managed globalization, so they were able to, to take advantage of the benefits without paying the cost. The region of the world which most succumbed to the dictates of the globalization as it was managed by the Washington International Institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, was Latin America. There was a set of policies called the Washington Consensus Policies that involved minimizing the role of government, privatization, liberalization, focusing on inflation, not worrying about growth, not worrying about unemployment. And in fact, the result of this is, has been, that the growth has been very disappointing. Growth in the 90s, the first decade of the Washington Consensus policies in Latin America, was just over half of what had been in earlier decades of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Poverty has remained at a high level. In contrast to China, where they manage globalization correctly, and poverty has been reduced by hundreds of millions of people. Uh, probably in history, no, no, there's been no period in which so many people have been moved out of poverty so, so rapidly. Uh, more than 300 million people uh, in the span of 20 years, more people than live in the United States, uh, uh, have moved out of poverty uh, in that short span of time. So, Latin America, in some sense, represents the failure of globalization when it's not well managed. East Asia represents the success of globalization when it is well managed. So first, China and the other East Asian countries took a very comprehensive approach to development. Secondly, they are a very balanced approach, making sure the jobs got created as jobs got destroyed, and the understanding the many dimensions to these strategies. The third thing they did was they were very picky about what aspects of globalization were important and how to sequence it. So for instance, they opened up, China opened it up itself for foreign direct investment, but did not open itself up to short-term speculative capital flows because they said, we're not ready for it. Those flows are destabilizing, and they were right. So they got the foreign direct investment, which helped their economy grow, but they didn't have to pay the price of the destabilizing short-term capital flows. So they managed international globalization in a way to shape it for their own advantage. But as I said, there's more to globalization than just economic globalization. 
Globalization involves the movement of well, as well of ideas, knowledge across borders, ideas about democracy, human rights. Those have spread around the world. Knowledge about how to extend life expectancy, greater improved health, has also led to an increase in life, living, uh, life expectancy uh, in both uh, advanced industrial countries and the uh, developing world. The sad point is that too often economic globalization has interfered with the benefits of the kinds of globalization, all these other benefits. For instance, one of the things that happened in the last round of the trade negotiations was that there was strengthening intellectual property. Intellectual property are co patents, copyrights, important to provide incentives for innovators, writers, creative people, to, to engage in their creative activity. Everybody recognizes the importance of intellectual property. But one has to get a balanced intellectual property regime that recognizes the rights, the benefits, and the costs, the rights and benefits to users, to researchers, uh, the cost that, uh, that can result from monopoly that is often associated with excessively strong intellectual property rights. One of the consequences of the intellectual property provision of the Uruguay Round, which is called TRIPS, was that it made it more difficult for those in developing countries to have access to generic medicines. And the result of that was that the price of medicines rose enormously. In effect, when they signed the agreement on the Uruguay Round in Marrakesh in 1994, they were signing the death warrants for hundreds of thousands of people in Sub-Saharan Africa and the rest of the developing countries. Because at the higher prices that resulted from those provisions, the fact that generic medicines would not be available, most of the people in those countries would not be able to afford life-saving medicines, for instance, for AIDS. Just to, to give you a, a picture of the magnitude of what we're talking about, a year's worth of prescriptions for AIDS medicines in the United States costs around $10,000. It costs under $300 to produce these medicines. Generic producers can make them available for under $300. And yet, under the intellectual property provisions, where producers in South Africa and Brazil could not make them available at these costs. At $10,000, people living on $500 a year cannot, cannot afford those prices. That's an example of where globalization has failed. It has put economic values, the profits of multinational pharmaceutical companies above the interest, above the other values, including the value of life itself. And that's just one example of values which, which have been given short shrift in the globalization debate. The environment has often been destroyed. I believe that if we shape, we make globalization work in the right way, we can actually make it a force for preserving the environment. But the way it's often been managed in the past, it has led to the destruction of the environment. So these are some of the examples, some of the ways, some of the reasons that there is, is discontent, such discontent, with globalization. Yes, it has the power to produce enormous benefits, to raise living standards, to provide medicines, but too often it has not lived up to, to, those, to those promises. It's not produced growth, it's not produced stability, it's not reduced poverty in many countries of the world, uh, and it has put in jeopardy other values that are of enormous consequence. Now that leads to the natural question, why has globalization failed? It has enormous pop potential benefit, 
but so often it has not lived up to that potential. And in my mind, there is a single reason, and that is that economic globalization has outpaced political globalization. Globalization means the closer integration of the countries of the world. There's been a lowering of transportation costs, of, of communication costs, elimination of many of the man-made barriers to movements of goods and services, capital, even labor in some cases across boundaries. But the, that closer integration means that we're more interdependent. When we're more interdependent, we need to act together. We need to act cooperatively. 150 years ago, a similar process was in play. The formation of the nation state. Transportation costs were coming down, communication costs were coming down, uh, and national units were being created. But then we had this, the nation state that could regulate, that could make nation building work to make sure that these enormous economic forces work to the benefit of all the citizens of the country. Today, we don't have that kind of overarching political process. We have, in a way, a, a forms of, of political interaction that are very flawed. And the result of this is that there is a democratic deficit, a democratic deficit at the global level. And that means the decisions that are made at the global level do not reflect the, well, the interest, the well-being of all the citizens of the world. Too often this, this democratic deficit results in the interest, well-being of corporate, corporations, special interest, dominating over those of ordinary citizens all over the world. In fact, it's not just a matter of the developing countries versus the developed countries. Quite often, the citizens of the developed countries suffer as well. It is really a question of special interest and corporate interest against the well-being of citizens all over the world. I mentioned, for instance, before the importance of, of uh, agricultural uh, subsidies and the way that they depressed prices. Uh, you know, the farmers all over the world, developing countries, receive. Those subsidies cost taxpayers in the developed countries enormous amounts of money, hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars every year. So the citizens of these countries are, are, are paying an enormous price to benefit a very small number, a very small number of corporations. In the United States, the benefits of these huge subsidies go to a relatively small fraction of the farmers. Only 2% of Americans actually work in farming, but the fraction of those who get the benefits are very small. Very small fraction of the money goes to the small farmer. Most of the money goes to huge corporate farmers. For instance, in the area of cotton, 25,000 very well-off American cotton farmers divide amongst themselves three to four billion dollars a year. And the result of this is to depress the price of cotton, damaging the livelihood of some 10 million poor subsistence farm, cotton farmers in sub-Saharan Africa. I should make clear that, that the United States is not the only guilty party in, in terms of agricultural subsidies. The subsidies from Europe are actually larger than those of America, uh, Japan, all the advanced industrial countries have, have, have problems with subsidies. Uh, Europe complains that the United States has actually doubled its subsidies after the end of the Uruguay round when it promised to reduce. The United States complains that European subsidies are so much larger. Europe complains that America's subsidies are focused on producers, production. America complains that Europe 
subsidizes exports. They spend almost enormous amount of energies blaming each other. If they spent that same time dealing with the problem, the world would be a lot better off. Take the case of European cow, which has gotten an enormous amount of notoriety. The average cow in Europe today receives a subsidy of close to $2 a day. That's a number that resonates because the World Bank defines poverty as living under $2 a day. 40% of the people in the world live on less than $2 a day. It is better to be a cow in Europe than to be than to be an average person in the developing world. One of the reasons that NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement between the United States and Mexico, was such a failure, did not live up to the expectation, was that the poorest people in Mexico were actually made poorer because the poorest people in Mexico were the corn farmers eke out a bare living, producing corn, selling a little bit. The result of joining NAFTA, joining with the United States, was that American corn, highly subsidized corn, was allowed into Mexico, and the price of corn fell by 50%. Obviously, some people in the city were better off, but those who depended for their livelihood on corn producing corn were made much worse off, and the rural poverty, as a result, increased. Twenty years ago, when the current era of globalization began, there was a certain set of doctrines, a certain set of beliefs. The belief was that Liberalizing trade, taking away trade barriers, would lead to more trade. More trade would lead to more growth. More growth would lead everybody to be better off, both in developed and less developed countries. Each one of those hypotheses, assumptions, has now been questioned. Trade liberalization has not led to more trade for many of the developing countries, or at least not substantially more trade. And the reason is that there are a host of other barriers. And some of these barriers are really so large that the reduction of the tariffs is insignificant. If you don't have ports, eliminating a tariff doesn't, doesn't allow you to export. If you don't have the roads to bring your products to the market, eliminating tariffs doesn't allow you to export. If you don't have anything to sell, what are sometimes called supply constraints, then eliminating tariffs doesn't help. Moreover, too often the advanced industrial countries have been very clever. As they've reduced tariff barriers, they've increased non-tariff barriers. So, for instance, they have what are a whole set of restrictions called phytosanitary conditions, a big word that means restrictions that say you can't sell certain foods, certain uh, plants, uh, because they aren't safe. If they were really designed, if they were really, of course, no, if they were really doing what they were supposed to do, that wouldn't be a source of complaint. But too often they are used by as little other than a protectionist device. As an example, Brazil is not allowed to sell beef to the United States because of fear of hoof and mouth disease. Now there are large areas of Brazil that are certified free of the disease. And there is absolutely no problem of there should be no problem of taking beef from that area and exporting it. You can constantly monitor, you can see whether the beef has, has been exposed. We have very strong safeguards, and yet the United States will not allow the export of that. If 
the one part of Brazil were a separate country, there'd be no problem. But you take a big country, and if there's a problem in one part, you can use that as an excuse to say nothing from the whole country can be exported. The United States tried to stop the export of avocados from Mexico, saying that there were fruit flies. Very, very small fruit flies. Mexicans said, we can't see them. He said, that's the point. That's why they're so dangerous. They're invisible fruit flies. And then they said, well, you send your inspectors down to Mexico. We'll allow your inspectors to go and see if you can find them on the, uh, on the, on the, on the plant. They sent them down. They couldn't find them. And they said, yes, that's because they're so invisible. Finally, they proposed, we'll only allow, uh, the Mexicans said, just, just allow us to bring them into to, to, to Boston in the middle of winter. The theory was that you would have a, them in the cargo of a plane, you open up the cargo door, the cold New England air would freeze any invisible fruit fly, instantly killing it. No danger to the California avocado producers. Again, the United States said no. I wondered why, and then I figured out the reason. There is one day in January when Americans eat more avocados than in all the rest of Europe put together on Super Bowl Sunday, when for four hours Americans eat guacamole, the most important ingredient of which is avocado, nonstop for four hours as they watch this uh, football game. So that was why it was so important to the California avocado growers. Eventually, there was talk of maybe there were invisible fruit flies in American corn and maybe Mexico might stop the allowing American corn to go in the United States into Mexico because of these fruit flies and eventually an agreement was reached. But this illustrates how these phytosanitary conditions can be used as a trade barrier and a very effective one at that. Billions of dollars of exports from the developing countries are, are kept out of the advanced industrial countries because of this. And the stories like this can be told over and over again. So in many respects, it's not a conflict between the advanced industrial countries and the developing countries. It's a conflict between corporate interests, special interests, and the well-being of people all over the world. Well, we can see this democratic deficit in a number of ways. One aspect of it is that the voting rights in these international institutions do not accord in any way with our commonly accepted principles of, of democracy. I know of no democracy where rich people, say like George Soros, can get billions of dollars, or Bill Gates can get billions of votes simply because they have billions of dollars. Uh, we have believe in the principle of one person, one vote. And yet, in the IMF and in the World Bank, voting is improportional to the wealth of the country. And not even the income of the country as of today, the income of the country to a large extent at the end of 19, the World War II when these institutions were created, with some adjustments since then. So countries like China, which have been growing for 25, 30 years, are vastly underrepresented in the voting rights that they have. That's only one of the problems. Another problem is that the, those who represent the country tend to come from particular interest groups. So for instance, the IMF makes decisions that affect every aspect of society in the developing countries. They don't have a very big effect on on the banks, industrial countries in the United States, and France, and Britain. But in the developing countries, they tend to, to really shape every aspect, every aspect of economic policy. And yet, those, the people who shape those policies, the governance, the decision makers, are the finance ministers and the central bank governors. They, quite naturally, reflect the interests and perspectives of financial markets. They don't worry about jobs, they don't worry about uh, growth, uh, they worry about inflation. They worry about inflation because when inflation goes up, the value of bonds goes down. And so bondholders lose. 
And so they reflect the interest of bondholders more than of society in general. They may think of themselves as doing what is best for the country, but their mindset is very much what is best for Wall Street is best for the country. It's not, it's not actually true. And, and the result of that is the policies that they have pushed have not been, in general, best either for the developing countries or for the developed countries. I mentioned a few minutes ago the fact that the IMF had pushed capital market liberalization, opening up markets to the flow of speculative, hot speculative money, destabilizing countries, leading to global financial instability. Well, Wall Street made an enormous amount of money. They make money when capital flows in. They make money when capital flows out. They make money when there's restructuring, when there's a disaster. They make money whatever comes out. But the rest of the country, the rest of the developing countries, suffer. So their mindset, they focus on, uh, on these policies which Wall Street thinks of as good for them and may be good for the rest of the world. But the evidence is very strongly to the contrary. So that is an example of what happens when you have special interest at the critical role in decision making. The same thing goes in the WTO, the World Trade Organization, where the important agreements defining trade occur. I talked about access to life-saving medicines. That was uh, part of the Uruguay Round Agreement. The trade ministers do not understand intellectual property. I know that firsthand because I was inside the White House at the time that the Uruguay Round was being negotiated. Both the Office of Science and Technology Policy and the Council of Economic Advisors thought that the intellectual property provision of the Uruguay Round was bad. We thought it was bad for American science. We thought it was bad for global science. We thought it was bad for developing countries. But our views were not what won the day. It was the interest of the pharmaceutical industry and the entertainment industry whose view was the stronger the intellectual property rights, the better. We knew that wasn't true. We knew that excessively strong intellectual property rights may not only lower welfare by reducing access to life-saving medicine, may not only lower welfare because of monopolization, but actually may result in a slower pace of innovation. Because the most important input into innovation, into research, is access to other ideas. And if you make those ideas less accessible by excessively strong intellectual property rights, you will actually slow the pace of innovation. The trade ministers don't, didn't understand this. And the result was this intellectual property provision that, that was so unbalanced. Well, that's the general problem, that you have the decisions being made basically by special interests. And this contrasts very strongly with the way we make decisions within our own democracies. Again, I saw this firsthand within, when I was in, in the White House, where where we were involved in making large numbers of very complicated, important decisions, and the voices of large numbers of different groups were all at the table. And we would argue, we would fight. Some voices were heard louder than others, but every voice was heard. The result, you can see the contrast in the results that, 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 that emerge. For instance, at the time, one of the central pillars of the Clinton administration was increasing access to health. And we understood how high drug prices reduced access to health. So domestically, we were trying to improve access to health. And the voice of the pharmaceutical companies was heard, but only as one part of a number of other voices where the concern was, most importantly, the well-being of American citizens. But when we went internationally, those voices weren't heard. 
only one voice was heard, and that was the voice of the drug companies. They raised the prices and they denied reduced access to life-saving medicines. Let me consider another issue. Social Security, old age pensions. This has been one of the major advances in all the, uh, many of the countries of the world, the provision of, of, of insurance uh, for elderly people so they don't live in poverty. It has been the most important anti-poverty program uh, all over the world. It used to be that large fractions of the population over 65 lived in poverty. Today in the United States, relatively few people live in poverty, and it's because of Social Security. It has been a successful program. It is actually a very efficiently run program. The administrative costs of uh, the U.S. Social Security program are much lower than any comparable private insurance company. It's very consumer responsive. We've done studies that looked at uh, consumer satisfaction, how quickly do consumer, do, do, do they respond to telephone inquiries, how accurately, and they are among the most uh, highly rated of, of any institution, private or public, uh, in America. The Clinton administration very strongly fought against privatization of Social Security. The Bush administration tried to engage partial privatization of Social Security. There was a democratic debate, and the result of that democratic debate in the United States was a vast, overwhelming opposition to privatization of Social Security. People realized that privatization of these old-age pension would increase their insecurity. They would realize that it would increase the number of people in poverty. They realized it would increase transaction costs. Wall Street would benefit because they would be minister ministering these funds, and what is to the rest of society as a cost is an income to Wall Street. So they were obviously very much strongly supportive, but the rest of America realized the costs were enormous. It would result in huge deficits, increase in the deficit in the United States uh, was estimated to re in the first 10 years to be between one and two trillion dollars. And yet, in the developing countries, the IMF and the U.S. Treasury pushed privatization of Social Security and old age pensions. The results were disastrous. For instance, Argentina had a crisis at the beginning of this decade. Many people blamed the huge government deficit. In fact, the government deficit was only 3%, smaller than the U.S. deficit is today. But more telling, almost the entire deficit was a result of privatization of Social Security, which the IMF had, caused, had, had pushed. So the problem in Argentina was caused, was pushed by outsiders, by the privatization of Social Security. Now, this is an example where had there been a democratic debate within Argentina, with all the voices understood, all the voices heard, there might have been a pushback very high probability it would not have occurred. But that's not the, what, ha, what occurred in Argentina and many other countries. What happened was they were given, as a condition of getting a loan, a condition of getting assistance, they were told, you have to privatize. You have to privatize Social Security, undermining democracy within these countries. So the what I'm trying to illustrate is that in a wide range of issues within our democracy, we bring various voices to the table. And as these various voices are brought to the table, we understand the pros and the cons. All public policy, public policy issues are complicated. But as we debate them, we come up with answers that are often different from the answers of the special interest groups. To give you a third example, I talked about before how financial markets, bond markets, focus on inflation. Most of uh, workers focus much more on, on, on jobs. Obviously, if you have hyperinflation, if inflation is going up at 10, 20% a month, uh, society, economy can't function. Uh, 
But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about cases where inflation is moderate. And at that level of moderate inflation, do you worry also about employment? Do you also worry about growth? America's Federal Reserve, our, our central bank, has a mandate that looks not just at inflation, but on growth and employment. And yet the IMF has pushed countries around the world to have central banks focus only on inflation. And the result of this, of course, is that you wind up with maybe lower inflation, but much higher unemployment. One of the consequences in Latin America, which I cited before as one of the examples of the failure of these Washington consensus policies, is that unemployment has increased over the last 15 years uh, under the Washington consensus policies. When, when the market economy developed over the last 50, 100, 150, 200 years, governments and the nation states found ways of tempering it, found ways of making the market work. So not just corporations, but everybody would benefit it. They imposed environmental laws because they recognized that without those environmental laws, firms had incentives to pollute. Why pay the cost of, of controlling your pollution if you can just spew the air pollution into the air or water pollution into this water? And the result of this was that life expectancies were adversely affected. People were worse off. In fact, in 19th century England, we have evidence that overall the degradation of the environment led to, to uh, people being less healthy, shorter. It was really uh, terrible consequences of these earlier days of, of the growth of the market economy. Well, since then, we've learned how to have government regulations that control, control the environment. We've had government regulations that protect workers, provide for worker safety. Firms on their own didn't do that. We realized also that government plays a very important role in making the market work. For a market economy to work, people have to have confidence that when they invest money in the stock market or when they invest money and in put their money in a bank, the bank isn't going to go bankrupt or the stock market money isn't going to be stolen. And you need strong regulations. We've seen over and over again those kinds of abuses that happen without those regulations. Even with the enormous number of regulations that we had in the United States, in the 1990s, we had a whole raft of new forms of abuses that, typified by Enron, Arthur Anderson, where the accounting companies were not providing the numbers, the information that needed to make a market economy work. They were providing the information to get the CEO to pay up as much as they could. And the result is that you had this enormous increase in inequality, the CEO pay skyrocketing, getting people getting paid not just millions, but in some cases hundreds of millions of dollars. But when the company went bust, the rest of the shareholders were left in the lurch. Workers were left out without jobs. Those who had invested in, in their retirement accounts were left without retirement accounts. Uh, it was it, it, enormous co cost to society. Without the confidence of strong regulations, people won't turn their money over and capitalism can't work. And so we've recognized that there are many roles that the government needs to play to make the market economy work. It needs to protect the environment and protect workers. It needs to regulate the economy to make sure that these abuses don't, don't occur. There are also important needs in terms of expenditures, airports, roads, most importantly, basic research, education, are all things that the government provides. That requires taxes. So government 
in markets today, we realize our partners. And within our democracies, we've been exploring how to make this partnership work. But again, internationally, because we don't, because of this demo, democratic deficit, we haven't gotten the balance right. We have, to a too large extent, had the agenda set by corporations, by these special interests, for their own interest. I've given several examples. Let me give you a couple more that highlight the imbalance that has occurred between the way we run democracies at home and the way globalization has been managed internationally. I talked about the environment. One of the things that those who anti-environmentalists have, have, have consistently been pushing have been a set of provisions that would say whenever you pass a regulation, you have to compensate firms for the loss of profits. So you pass a regulation that says you can't pollute, that obviously is going to lower the profits of the company, and you have to pay the company for the loss of profits. The question is, does the company have the right to pollute, or do you, citizens of the world, have the right to have clean air? And what they were basically saying, these anti-environmentalists, is the rights of corporations predominate. They have the right to pollute, and if you take away that right, you have to compensate them. Well, of course, the Clinton administration, most people, most courts have said, that's outrageous. Uh, the right to clean air is a right of every citizen, and the corporations do not own the atmosphere. And yet, and yet, when the United States signed the North American Free Trade Agreement. It gave foreign investors more rights than American investors did. And in Mexico, American investors have more rights than Mexican investors have in Mexico. The result of this has been a provision deliberately designed to stifle environmental regulation. For instance, in a small village in Mexico, they decided to pass a regulation saying you cannot have a toxic waste dump in the middle of the city. Any city would have a regulation like that. Nobody wants to have a toxic waste in the middle of the city polluting their water supply. And yet, under the North American Free Trade Agreement, Mexican government was forced to compensate the owner of this land because the land could not be used as a toxic waste dump. And there are actually billions of dollars of these suits right now under file. We don't know how many of them will prevail, but this was the kind of provision that was put in the North American Free Trade Agreement. If you had had a, a vote on this, I believe that citizens in America, citizens in Mexico would have voted against it. Just as if you put up the issue should the poorest people in Africa have access to life-saving medicines, AIDS medicines? If you put that up to a vote, 